Good afternoon. This is Susan Welby from the Epilepsy Foundation New England, and I'd like to welcome you today to our webinar, Preparing for Your Telehealth Visit, with Dr. Lori Douglas, Division Co-Chief of Pediatric Neurology and Director of the Pediatric Epilepsy and EEG at Boston Medical Center, and Dr. John Gatanis, who is Chief of Pediatric Neurology at Tufts Floating Hospital for Children. So today's presentation on, on telehealth visits will include your, uh, a handout at the end for you to download on making the most of your telehealth visit. And if you have any difficulties with downloading that, feel free to reach out to me in the chat window or by email and I will happily send that to you. So with further ado, I'd like to introduce you to Dr. Lori Douglas. Oh, uh, well, it's great to be here. I am so uh, delighted to be doing this with Dr. Gitanis uh, today. Uh, we planned on talking to you about preparing for your telehealth visit. We are both pediatric neurologists. I know there may be some people online that receive neurological care who are adults. We'll do our best to make it uh, apply to all populations regardless of age. Um, and I'm gonna let my colleague lead and start us off for today. That sounds great. So, and I'm ha very happy to be here too, coming from Tufts Medical Center. Um, this visit in many ways is sort of like telehealth. We're doing a conference, but we're doing it virtually. And so if, for those patients who haven't yet done telehealth, this is very much what the visits are, are like. Um, we're going to go through a lot of different aspects of telehealth. If, if you do the next slide, Lori, we'll talk a little bit about some of the reasons behind um, why we do telehealth and why it came about. Of course, the biggest uh, reason that this thing exploded was because of coronavirus. And, and because of the COVID-19 pandemic, there was this sudden need to do social distancing. It's not as if telehealth suddenly developed overnight, though. It's something that we had been working towards and developing for years, but due to the coronavirus, it really exploded overnight. And of course, the primary focus in, in using telehealth was really to keep patients safe. And we have a lot of patients who have very specific circumstances. Some have severe asthma or the lung disease. Within epilepsy, we, we have some patients who do worsen when they have fever or infection. And it became a priority to make sure those patients are safe. In the pediatric world, there was specific concern for Dravet syndrome, which is a syndrome that is known to worsen in terms of seizures when patients are sick. And we, we have to always then judge what's the risk of bringing them around people or, or into a hospital. Um, there are other reasons, though, why it can really work well. So whether you're an adult patient or whether you're a parent of a child, Either way, there can be issues where you have to juggle your work schedule, you have to juggle child care with these visits. Um, sometimes the distance to travel can be extensive. We have some families who travel from out of state or who have more than a couple of hours of travel. And so suddenly what used to be a full day of coming to Boston, parking, driving home, now can be done in just that half hour or 40 minute visit without any, without any inconvenience to the family. And of course, many patients come with wheelchairs, oxygen, other special equipment. It's just such a nightmare sometimes trying to go from the parking garage, down the elevator, find the clinic when, when you're traveling with hundreds of pounds worth of equipment. And so this ability to use telehealth now for, for so many of these special circumstances is allowing families to do their visit much more easily, not spend an entire day, and not put their loved ones at risk. And so those are some of the main reasons why telehealth has really taken off. There are other advantages too that we might not think of um, immediately, but might become reasons that telehealth will continue to be a growing area. For example, there, there is potential that we could do telehealth into an emergency department or into a pediatrician's office or an internal medicine doctor's office. So there's a chance that we could do more rapid consultations using this kind of technology. The other thing that's really nice for the physician is that we sometimes go to multiple satellite locations. I no longer have to worry about where I am on that given day. I could, if I need to see a patient urgently, I could see them regardless of which satellite I'm at. So for example, I'll go to both Brockton and Chelmsford. These are two very different locations. But if a patient lives near 
Brockton and yet I'm in Chelmsford that day, they don't have to drive an hour and a half to see me. We can we can still do the visit through telehealth. The other thing I really like, I think, for future growth is that we now have the ability to do weekend or evening hours much more easily. The reason we haven't done those is we typically need staff to open the office. We need to have an MA present. We need a front desk staff available. For telehealth, we don't need that staffing. And so it's possible to coordinate evening or weekend hours. Most practices haven't started to do that yet, but if telehealth continues, I, I expect that that will be a, a very common practice so that people don't have to miss work uh, or don't have to juggle some of the family issues. The other issues I think are, that are very important too is that not everybody has easy access to specialized care. So for those who really have to seek out care of an epileptologist, that sometimes is difficult if you live in rural uh, Maine or parts of Vermont. And rather than having to come all the way to Boston, we have a much, we'll have a much easier time, I think, getting those consultations done through telehealth. Uh, you can also, for questions that the physician may have, if, you know, the biggest one is usually med what medications are you on, but other things too, like if there's special equipment issues at home, uh, you don't have to worry if you forgot to bring it because you didn't forget anything because you're home. So it's now, rather than worrying that, oh, I forgot to bring those bottles with me, you have everything you need there. You can you can show the physician exactly what you're taking in terms of meds, or you can show the equipment that you might need for patients, for adult patients who might have issues with um, with ambulating and getting around the house safely. If they have special needs, like in the bathroom setting or navigating stairs, this might allow us to come into the home and and almost serve as a consultation to see if the home is safe for that patient or what kind of equipment needs might be needed. And for children, at least, I think one of the biggest advantages being a pediatrician, being a child neurologist, is that the child gets to be in their own element. So they get to play with their toys, sit on their couch. Um, they get to be in their pajamas, which is great. I wish I could be in my pajamas, too. That would make my, my job so much better. But, um, you know, so there's not actually, as a child neurologist, there's nothing better than seeing that child in pajamas with their dog. Um, sometimes the dog's on their lap with their toys and stuffed animals with them, they feel so comfortable for the visit. It just facil facilitates a much better uh, and much smoother uh, visit for the patients. And so those are some of the, that's, yeah. Go ahead, I was gonna say, may I add a few things to that oh, list? Absolutely. So a couple of things that we've done telehealth for even preceding the pandemic has been for patients who are on ketogenic diet it's a lovely way to do teaching around diet. It's a lovely way to figure out what are the necessary tools maybe that the patient or family are missing to help them with implementing the diet, which can be kind of difficult. The other um, reasons I've found it really helpful has been around safety. So doing a safety evaluation and providing advice. And then the other time is when people are convalescing or recovering from a seizure, they may not feel well enough to really come to the clinic. And at the same time, they're not feeling well, it would be the most important time for me to see them. So having the ability to do it over the web makes such a difference for them. Yeah, I agree. Those are all great points. And you know, we don't wanna, we don't wanna sell this as if, um, it's not like we're selling you a used car right now. I don't want you to think this is all good, 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 good. There are some disadvantages, just like with everything in life. And one of the biggest ones that I see is we lose a little bit of that human element during a visit. It's just never going to be the same talking to like a talking head in a small square. It's never the same as doing things in person. And so there's a lot that happens during a visit. But one of the most important things is the families are trying to see if they can trust the physician. So much harder to do, so much harder to, to really get a feeling for that person, especially on a first visit when it's done electronically. And part of what really complicates that is sometimes the streaming quality just does not allow us to have a natural conversation. If the streaming is interrupted and it becomes jittery on the audio, then it's the conversation just doesn't go smoothly. It becomes harder to ask and answer questions. Similarly with the video, if the video is jerky, I may not be able to do all the parts of the examination as I normally would. And so it, it may limit my ability to either counsel or to really complete a very confident exam. <clears throat> Even if the streaming is perfect, though, there might be some parts of the physical exam that can't be done uh, through telehealth alone. And that would be things like looking at the back of the eye, tapping reflexes. So there's certain aspects, 
listening to lungs or heart. Certain aspects of the exam will never really do quite as well as we can in person. And sometimes with a visit, one of the reasons we have patients in the office, we like for, before coronavirus, it was always nice to try to coordinate that outpatient EG with the visit so that we can bring someone in on one day rather than two, or get the lab test done while you're in the office just to prevent the number of trips people have to make. Now that we're doing this through telehealth, it doesn't allow us to coordinate those things quite as easily. I used to like to do multidisciplinary visits where I can work with the gastroenterologist on that day or the physiatrist or developmental pediatrician. We could see the patients together, interact together. I don't get to do it quite in the same way uh, through telehealth, but we do have now options so you're aware that if we do need to bring other physicians, therapists, family members, most of the telehealth platforms do allow us to bring third or fourth parties onto the call. So just wanted to talk a little bit about what you can do to prepare for the visit before your actual visit starts. And these tips generally work for just about any age group. So one is to get all your medical information ready. And to be honest, a lot of what I'm going to tell you also applies to going to an in-person visit when you're actually going to the clinic. So making a list of all of your medications and the dosages, having that ready, it just makes it go smoother. Um, if you can, Get your actual medication bottles out, or if you take supplements, you know, have those ready. If you're on ketogenic diet and you have formula or you have different supplements that go into the formula, take those too. If you have a seizure log, have that ready. You might even send it in advance if that's possible for you. Always make a list of questions. Make sure that you get out the important ones and schedule a follow-up if you don't have time in that visit so that you can address them at a different meeting. If there have been recent events concerning for seizure or a new seizure type, get it on video if you can. That's not always possible, of course, but when that happens, that's really useful. And then communicate with your doctor's office staff and find out if there's a way that you can share that with your provider in advance. For children, we dose medications by weight. And so if you can, if you have a scale at home, get a weight and a height before the visit. If you can't, you might reach out to your primary care provider and find out if they have a recent one on file. And for adults, weight's also important because some of the medications we prescribe may impact your weight. And we wanna know if it's been helpful or hurtful as we're doing a follow-up visit. So just a picture of how you might lay out your medicines. The doctor might wanna be able to read the bottle. You wanna hold up that bottle right to the webcam when you're doing it. You wanna also think about what's the environment where I'm going to conduct this visit? Is the doctor gonna be able to see me? Will I be able to see them well? So set up an area with good lighting. And sometimes I'll join with families and they're sitting right in front of a bright window. So the bright window sounds terrific, except for it makes the screen totally difficult to see the patient. The patient becomes a shadow. So the best thing to do is if you do need to sit in front of a window, try to close curtains or close the blinds. Ideally, you will have indirect lighting or bright light overhead. Try to avoid background noise. During this pandemic, it's been very difficult, I think, Many people who have had um, more than one person at home working virtually, or maybe there are children in the home that are going to school, or there are young children who are running around. So do what you can. Uh, perhaps you can have some activity planned for other people in the house, or you can just warn them in advance. For young children, it really is helpful to have a second caregiver, if at all possible, that's somebody to help with entertaining. I've also found it's helpful for videoing. Sometimes I'll have parents join from more than one device. So one can actually do um, aiming of the video at the child while perhaps we're engaging in a conversation. Um, and then if you have other kids, just thinking about how are you going to keep them safe during the actual visit. For devices, as you know, you really can use any smart device. It could be a computer that is stationary like a desktop. It could be a laptop, the way I'm joining with you today. It could be a tablet or it could be a phone. Um, and portable devices are especially useful for young children because it allows you to move with them. It's 
especially the younger they are, the more they're on the go, the more a portable device can be useful. The added advantage of a phone is that you have the ability to flip the camera. So if you are the parent and you're trying to film your child, you can flip the camera so that you can see what the provider is seeing. The downside of the phone is that the screen is smaller, so you don't see your physician as well. Most of the time when I join, and I'm sure Dr. Gitanis does this too, is we do this from either a laptop or a desktop because we really need to see you. And so we want our screen to be as big as possible. And as I mentioned, you can join from more than one device. I've even had a single parent join from more than one device, just so they have that option of toggling with the portable device and really having a nice firm place to sit and talk with the other. If you are using phone, one of the things that was brought to my attention is you wanna make sure you have a place to actually rest it that's stable when you're actually doing the talking part of the visit. Otherwise, you're waving all across the uh, screen of the provider. So the other thing that's a little different when you're doing a telehealth visit is you're not going to be given a discharge summary with that plan that's been printed out for you. Um, and so we need to think about how do we communicate that plan to our patients? And I do this different ways for my patients depending on um, their abilities and, and mine at the time. So a lot of uh, providers' offices have an electronic medical record with a portal. The portal is one way that you get to see either the doctor's notes or you can communicate, such as sending a message to your provider, or they could message you with the plan. That's easy. Many of those portals are accessible from your phone. Um, you may ask that directions be emailed to you or mailed to you in the regular postal mail. The other thing is to always have a notebook ready or ask somebody who's in the home just to take notes for you. And that's true when you go to an in-person, having a notebook can be really helpful. I'm gonna talk a little bit about telehealth with toddlers, which adds a little extra element to things. So for kids who are on the go, it's nice to have a seat like a high chair, something that they can actually sit down maybe play a little bit while you're talking so they're not running around. That's one option. I've also conducted visits very nicely with parents sitting on the floor with their child and having some toys handy. It's also a great place for the provider to get a sense about the child's mobility, their motor skills, their sort of awareness of their surroundings, how they interact with others in the home. This is a picture. This child actually has autism, but he loves the computer screen. Um, and he was extremely attentive the other day when I was doing a telehealth visit. So I took this snapshot, obviously with their consent. And what his dad did, which was really terrific, is he sat down on the floor with the child, had toys that the child really, really loved. And really, I was able to get just about everything I needed in that telehealth visit. Maybe more because, as Dr. Gatanis was saying, is that it's nice to see them in their environment. Sometimes we see them at their very best. I don't usually have my parents try to measure their child's head, but it is something that anyone can really do when given the right instruction. So if you have a sewing measure tape, obviously not the type that you would use uh, for carpentry, but if you have one of the flexible ones, what you basically wanna do is take that measuring tape and go from the biggest prominence of the forehead to the biggest prominence in the back of the head. And then you slide it up and down until you get the largest number. And we do that usually in centimeters, so we can definitely uh, convert that. And if you have somebody else in the home that can just hold your child still while they're trying to wiggle, uh, extra helpful. It's quite likely though that your pediatrician has one on file. Other things to gather for the young child is think about having some brightly colored objects that will attract your child's attention, but are quiet. Because if we're trying to think about what do they see, if it's a toy that makes noise, I'm really testing hearing and not vision. Having a bell or a rattle or a noisemaker to think about hearing, also something to entertain them if they get a little cranky. Toys with buttons like cause and effects, things that light up, things that make fun sounds, that's always a good way to get a child's attention. It's also a good way for us to motivate them to reach so that we can get a sense if they have any shaking or tremor. Little books are fantastic. It really helps us to understand what does the child know 
Uh, what are they using for language? It also looks at fine motor skills as they're turning pages. A key or a pen cap can be useful. I'll show you why in just a minute. Having a small and safe snack is really helpful for a variety of reasons. I'd like to look at reaching. It's also something that always makes every child happy when they have food. And then some type of soft brush or a cotton ball or something that um, actually causes the child to move when actually tickled. So here's just some examples of some objects. I'll show you how we're going to use these. So a bell is great. I happen to not have a bell at home. A glass works just fine with a spoon. It makes a nice sound that gets the child's attention or rattles another one. Crayons, so young children, we like to see if they can hold that crayon and make a fisted grasp. Uh, older children, we're looking to see if they are actually developing a more mature grasp. And then just some examples of things the child might point or reach for. Here's some just child appropriate based on the developmental stage books and some examples of things that children might find attractive. And these are just some paintbrushes, but honestly, pastry brushes work, a uh, makeup brush works, a Q-tip works quite honestly. So whatever you have in the home, and if you don't, we can always improvise. So the exam, how do we do this? So language and mental status, it really depends on the child and if we've gotten them at the best time in their day. So every child has sort of that window when they're at their absolute best. And then there's always that window where they're maybe a little tired or a little hungry and they don't function as well. I think providers try their best to schedule visits around the optimal time, but it doesn't always work. And just in case, if your child's one of those shy kids or maybe those kids that has trouble adapting to new situations, you might video sort of highlights of your child doing special things like pointing to pictures in a book, having a conversation with a sibling, demonstrating some imaginative play, just in case the provider and you can't get them to do that in advance. So visual fields, generally what you wanna do if you have a young child, I can't do this as the provider on the other side of the screen, it has to be a parent. But essentially what you want to do is present an object from behind the child if you can. I'm gonna, I have a baby doll here and I don't know how many of you actually have me on your screen versus just my slide deck. But essentially what you want to do is present something that's brightly colored behind the child and see if they turn when that brightly colored object appears. And it should be something quiet because otherwise we're really just testing their hearing. So that was my colleague, Dr. Jessica Chow, with her new toddler trying to show this. Eye movements are also, a, if sometimes it can be challenging for me to get it uh, to happen if the child is not interested in my computer screen. So another way that we can do it is have the parent bring brightly colored objects from their side vision above to their other side and down below. Or the other thing that you can do with a small child, and I'm gonna demonstrate as opposed to the slide deck here again. This is the doll I use with my residents all the time to teach them the exam. Is you really can just turn their head and as, as the provider is talking to them, making funny sounds, their eyes are gonna look at the provider and the provider is going to be able to see those eye movements. Eye movements are important for a variety of reasons. It's important because it tests the lower centers of the brain, tells us a lot about that portion of the brain and how it's functioning. And a lot of the medications that are prescribed for seizures will cause jiggling of the eyes or nystagmus and especially where during this pandemic it's been hard to get lab tests, we really wanna look for signs of toxicity just so that we can best adjust medicines. Here's a, just a bright smile. We will do our best and we count on you to help us to get that smile. And if, for older persons, we're gonna ask you to do that funny thing your doc has probably asked you many times, which is to show us your teeth. Little children, we have to make smile. They don't always know how to show us their teeth. And again, that's testing the motor function of the face, which tells us about big regions in the brain. So hearing for a little child, you wanna present a sound from behind them. 
whenever possible and see if they turn in that direction. Reaching, so having a raisin or a Cheerio or something you know that your child will reach for, that again is important for a variety of reasons. It tests coordination, it tests for development because children develop this fine pincer grasp as they're maturing. And it's also looking for tremor. Some of the medicines that we prescribe will cause shakiness. And that's another way we can tell if the medicine is toxic or at a certain level in the body. Walking, very helpful to set this up in advance so you know where your child is going to be able to be viewed walking. Gait is very important. If people have had a seizure that affects one side of the body, one side of the body may be weak afterwards. So that's very helpful when we're watching them. It may reflect different developmental um, differences in one side of the brain. So set up something you know your child will walk towards that's useful. For older patients, um, just make sure that when you're joining your visit, your doctor is going to want you to walk. So you don't want to be in a tiny, tiny little office. It's better that either you have a portal device and maybe can go out to a hall when they want to look at you walking, or maybe from a bigger room if you can clear out other family members or roommates. Climbing is very important for the young child. We can't do a regular motor exam. We can't tell them lift your leg, lift your arms necessarily if they don't have a lot of language. But when we climb, we're actually using a lot of muscle groups. It tells us a lot about balance. Again, balance is thrown off when there's a problem with toxicity from medication, when there's a problem with the brain. It tells us about strength as well. And this is just an example of those tools I talked about where I might ask my patient's family member to tickle their child on their arm or on their cheek or on their foot and I'll be looking for withdrawal. It tells me sensation is intact. I almost never ask for someone to do this, but for those of you who have had a full neurological exam, you know that the doctor always takes out the bottom of their reflex hammer or perhaps another implement in the exam room and strokes the lateral border of the foot what we're looking for is to see if the toes go up or go down. It's not unusual after a prolonged seizure that somebody might have this reflex where the toes go up or if there's something new going on in the brain that the toes go up. I find this hard to do virtually. It's one of the limitations of telehealth, but I think if people have had enough telehealth visits, um, this is possible. I've also had primary care providers go into the home before the pandemic We've done telehealth while I'm in Boston, and sometimes they help me with the neurological exam. So I'm gonna let Dr. Gitanis take over at this point. That's a great overview. I, I'll add one uh, very sort of off topic thing about young kids, but I'm always reminded of the movie Monsters, Inc. when I do an observational exam. And for those who haven't seen it, the basic plot line is that monsters could generate energy if kids cry, or if, they, or if they laugh, but there was greater energy when the kids laughed. So it was always more favorable to have the kids laugh and be happy. Uh, very similar when it comes to examining young kids. I think we, we get a lot of information if kids are upset or if kids are happy, but we get better information when they're happy. And we, we like it when kids are happy too. Um, and that's true for older kids, that's true for adults. And what I'll say in the older kids is really, this really applies to adults as well, uh, that when we do the exam, and Lori outlined a lot of this, but when we do the exam, we, we go in a very uh, certain sequence. Each neurologist thinks of the exam in an orderly format because by following that format, it, it ensures that we have covered all parts of the nervous system. So we always start with questions that relate to what we call mental status. That refers to knowing if somebody's fully awake and alert, are they oriented, do they know the date, the time, um, do they know their location? How's their memory? How's their language? Some of that we get just through conversation, but we might ask more focused, directed questions along those lines. And those are things that can easily be done through telehealth. The next step of what we look at is the brainstem. So we want to look at whether the nerves that go out, out to the face and to, to the throat, um, even to the part, the part that lifts our shoulders and turns our head, we look at whether those nerves in the upper part of our body are working well. For some parts of that, we might need the person to be pretty close to the camera. Um, I could demonstrate, but I don't think you would want to look in the back of my throat. Um, that might be too personal, but 
we hate, what we might ask the patient to do is move close to the camera so we can see their eyes. You can always, everybody, pretty much everybody has a smartphone these days, so you can always use the flashlight from the back to look at pupils. We might have the patient turn their eyes right, left, up, down to see if the eye movements look appropriate. Have them smile to look at their facial expression, stick their tongue out. As strange as that seems to do on camera, those things are all very helpful for us. When it comes to testing strength, so the next step is really to look at the motor part of the exam, looking at your strength, looking at how the muscles feel, so the muscle tone, the muscle bulk. Some of those things are a little hard to do on camera. We, When we look at a toddler, for example, a toddler often can walk around in their diaper, so we can really get a good sense of their muscle bulk. But we're not going to ask um, a 19 or 20-year-old or an adult to walk around in their underwear. That would be a little awkward for telehealth. So we don't always see the whole. It's a little harder for us to appreciate that. It's also a little harder for us to get a sense of muscle tone because that's something we have to feel. When we talk about tone, we're talking about the resistance the muscle gives us to passive movement. And that's something that's much better done through in person. What we can assess really well though is strength. So we can have people rise to stand from their chair. We can have them toe walk. We can have them walk on their heels. We can do a deep knee bend. You can even do push-ups. Um, all those things are, are possible in terms of assessing strength. And those will give you a very good assessment of the person's strength. Similarly, we could, you know, it's light touch and, and sensation are things that we usually do in person, but that can be done through another person if they're present. They, you can have a family member just tickle the patient with a tissue just to make sure that the sensation is intact. There are some aspects of that that are much better done in the office, like vibration, um, but we can at least do temperature, we can at least do slight touch, and we can have somebody stand with their feet together, close their eyes to make sure that they know where they are in space. Um, one thing to keep in mind though, walking is a very important part. When we test coordination, we usually do a finger to nose, so we need good streaming for that, but also we need to test somebody's walking. And in order to do that, just plan that we just plan to have a little bit of space so that we can look at walking. Um, that's where doing a telehealth visit from the phone is very helpful because you can reverse the camera and then we can watch somebody walk up and down their, their hallway or their living room. But just think ahead that we might need a little extra space to, to be able to accomplish that. We do have some other um, situations in adults and older kids and adults that we might have to modify the exam. Um, we do see a lot of patients, I, I see a lot of patients for young adults who have autism, for example. In patients who, who have issues with sensory integration, it might be hard for them sometimes to really uh, attend to the visit through a computer. Some people are very sensitive to certain loud sounds or certain visual stimuli. Computer's not always gonna work for each patient. I have, this too is very helpful though to have a caregiver uses a cell phone because I've had families reverse the camera. And that way they're able to, I have a few patients who with autism who really need to stay in motion, they need to move through the visit. And I can always have the caregiver just kind of track the person. I can have conversations with them as they're walking through their house sometimes. Um, it gives me the full, one mom joked that we were getting the full floor of the house on that visit, but it's often necessary to do it that way because it might be hard for, for some patient populations to remain still through the whole exam. Uh, similarly, with when we look at some patients who have cerebral palsy, they have they might have equipment needs. So we, we might have some patients where it's a little bit hard to get them out of their chair. We can decide up front whether it'd be better to conduct a visit in their chair, which I usually prefer, or whether to do it if they're lying on a couch or bed. Um, but I'm okay with using the chair. We might, one thing that can be helpful though would be to take the braces off for the visit because we do like to see how um, the legs and the muscles look without the braces on. So at least exposing a little bit the, the bottom part of the legs, maybe taking the socks and braces off. Um, we might ask too that the chair be in a place where the family member can have easy access to the child and maybe be able to place the phone at a little bit of distance so we can watch as the family member moves the muscles through their range of motion. So we can get a little bit of sense of whether the muscles are tight or too stiff. Um, and communication can be a little harder for the patient too. We have to make sure the patient, that the phone is positioned so the patient can hear us adequately. And some of our patients do have trouble with verbal output or communication. They might need 
to use an assistive device. Um, that too can be obviously a little hard for telehealth. And so we, in those situations, we may need a family member to sort of translate for us. The child may be able to point to icons or use their device to communicate, but the family member may still have to then speak it to us so we can hear it more effectively through the phone. So those, those situations are, and then there are many others too where, that are uh, unique to telehealth. I do have some patients who, um, because they're uh, very severely ill, I have a few patients who really have been homebound before the coronavirus happened. And now I do have the ability to see them if they're in bed. I can still see them and go through the exam. I could do it in their home. They don't have to be moved. Um, so that's been a huge help. Um, as winter approaches too, for some of those patients who do have equipment needs, so you can see from this picture, this, this patient has an assistive chair, which is pretty heavy. And that kind of chair is really hard to load into a van. And you can imagine what that's like uh, on, a, on a February day when it's snowing, to get out of the house, get down the ramp, get to the assistive van, get to the office. Now I, we don't have to go through that. We can still do the visit and still do most of what we do in the office. Without all that, without without all the headaches of, of trying to make the visit. I couldn't agree more. I, I it's been one of the big advantages I think of telehealth. I think that is our last slide. I think we were going to open it to discussion. Thank you so much, Doctor. Gatanis and Dr. Douglas. I am looking at the question panel and I do not see any question panels, any questions posed in there today. I think it was very clear and straightforward and easy to understand. This session is being recorded and we will share this both with you, both of you doctors, as well as our parent share groups. So I really wanna thank you both for the time that you've taken today joining us and giving this important information in these changing times that we've all been living under. So I so appreciate it. Any last comments from you? It's been an absolute pleasure to do this and um, always a pleasure to be working with the foundation. Okay, great. Thank you so much. So that will be, I will end the, the webinar and I thank you both for your time today. That's great, thanks. You're most welcome.